Welcome, Dr. Neal. Kim, thank you so very much for the introduction. I am really looking forward to chatting with everybody today about the biggest breaches and what they mean for the future of cybersecurity. Uh, this talk comes uh, just uh, just post the launch of my uh, latest book, as you mentioned, Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone, which is which is available on, on Amazon. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the histories and the stories behind some of the biggest breaches. And I will also talk about what we need to do with regards to a roadmap for recovery for the future of cybersecurity, specifically from the area of investments. Where do we need to be investing more in cybersecurity? What sub areas and, and why? So let me go ahead and just uh, get into it. You know, I, I, given your introduction, the, the only thing I, I, I'll mention here is that I've seen cybersecurity from a bunch of different angles. Uh, I have, uh, you know, worked with Stanford ever since I got my PhD there. I've sat in the seat of an investor looking at a whole bunch of cybersecurity startups. I've been a, uh, a CISO and I've also, uh, you know, started a cybersecurity company myself that got acquired by Twitter. So I've seen just the space from a whole bunch of angles. And um, there's there's a bunch of things that uh, I'm, I'm dismayed about, and there's a bunch of things that I'm excited about. I'm hoping to talk about both of those. Uh, in this talk today, I'm going to talk about why some of the biggest breaches have occurred, how some of the biggest breaches have occurred. I'll talk about some technology defenses that we should all be leveraging to address the root causes of breach. And then I'll talk a little bit about where we need to go with regards to future investments in, in cybersecurity. One of the things that I thought was interesting is that prior to publishing the Big Breaches book, um, while there have been many, many breaches that have been taking place, I wasn't able to find one source which, say, studied all the mega breaches and all the 9,000 reported breaches to date and really coalesced what have been the root causes from a scientific and engineering perspective such that we can, we can get those addressed and, and move forward as a field and hopefully have fewer breaches. So... Uh, let me just go ahead and start talking about um, the the root causes. So from, from an analysis of the 9,000 reported breaches, that uh, data that's come in through the Identity Theft Resource Center and privacyrights.org, if you look at all the breaches that are taking place, um, there's really only five or six root causes behind them. Uh, for those of us that have been CISOs in the past, we have tons of security compliance standards to satisfy. We have hundreds of checkboxes to check. Um, and to an extent, I worry that we're, we're, we're suffering death from a thousand cuts. So what are the, say, five or six key things that you need to make sure you have countermeasures for if you want to avoid a big breach? Um, and those things are listed here on the left of the slide. Uh, if we look at it, uh, unencrypted data, phishing and malware, third-party compromise or abuse, software security, and inadvertent employee mistakes separate from phishing. Phishing is so prevalent as an employee error that it deserves its own category. But uh, if you look at it, it's really these uh, five or six key issues that have resulted in most hacks and breaches. You can see I've listed some of them to the right. You might be interested in how many of these breaches have occurred due to, to, due to which of these reasons. Well, I um, downloaded a database from privacyrights.org and basically summarized all that data in this, in this histogram where on the x-axis below, we have different causes of breach. And on the y-axis, we have the number of reported breaches that have occurred due to that reason. So from this graph, it looks like hacking or malware is the, the biggest root cause, if you will. But that doesn't take into account the fact that if you look at the bars for physical loss and you look at the bars for portable devices, um, breaches that occur due to physical loss and portable devices are not breaches if data on the media or the devices are encrypted. So let's say that there's a whole bunch of hard drives that are getting transported from one place to the other. Or let's say you have somebody's mobile device that simply gets lost or stolen. If encryption is enabled on those hard drives and the mobile devices, there is no breach. And if you look at those two bars, physical losses and portable devices, you combine them together, it is much larger than hacking or malware. So, so as um, a security professional or as a CISO, when you get into an organization, uh, identify all sensitive data and get it encrypted. 
turn on file vault, turn on BitLocker, turn on um, uh, as much application level security encryption that you, as you can. And that will help address a whole bunch of things that could have otherwise turned into breaches. So now that I've said that, let me delve more deeply into the, the hacking or malware bar here and all the breaches that have occurred due to um, external, say, attackers or inadvertent exposures. And I'm going to go back to the to the target breach from 2013, in which over 40 million credit card numbers were, were stolen by the attackers. Um, the way that this attack occurred was one of their third parties by the name of Fazio Mechanical Services had network credentials stolen. Fazio Mechanical Services was the heating and air conditioning provider for Target, as well as a whole bunch of other retail stores. But what the attackers did is after they broke in and got network credentials for Fazio Mechanical, they were pretty easily able to pivot into Target's network because it was a flat network. There was almost no segmentation. So they were able to go from uh, breaking the heating and air conditioning providers to pivoting into breaking into the point of sale stations in all the Target retail stores. There were a bunch of steps in between, but that's basically what happened. And what the attackers did um, around the Thanksgiving or just before the Thanksgiving timeframe is they had um, tested to see if they could get credit card numbers off of a few of those point of sale stations. They saw that they were successful. And so then they turned it on uh, in, in all of them. And uh, basically they were able to, to, to steal the 40 million credit card numbers. Um, they, they used a bunch of tools. Uh, third party uh, risk was an issue, of course, third party compromise. Once the attackers got into Fazio Mechanical, they started sending out phishing and malware uh, attacks. And the impact of this breach was quite significant. It was the first breach in which both the CEO and the CISO were fired. The board was sued. Uh, the breach costs were over 250 million. Very, very significant uh, issue. Um, so that's how the, the, the target breach uh, occurred. Um, and you can see some of the root causes playing out, third-party compromise, phishing, and malware. Just the very next year, J.P. Morgan Chase got breached. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase is a very large uh, bank. They were spending over $250 million on security annually the year that they got breached. And to an extent, when, when a bank gets breached, you kind of worry, can people transfer money? Like what, you know, what, what's the worst that could, that could happen? You could imagine that the attackers were able to transfer money, that, that, that could have been, that could be the end of it for a bank because then trust is completely gone. Now, what happened to this particular breach was not as bad. The attackers were able to get into JP Morgan Chase. They stole 70 million customer names and email addresses. So we know that phishing attacks have been an issue for a very long time. And when most phishing attacks started in the early and mid 2000s, the attackers would send out blanket emails uh, claiming to be from a bank, hoping that you actually banked with one of those banks, clicked on a link, uh, went to an imposter banking website and entered your credentials. Now, if you steal 70 million customer names and email addresses from a bank, you know that they're all customers of the bank and you could do much more targeted spear phishing attacks. Uh, so that was that was what got stolen uh, and was the was the impact of this breach. Uh, what resulted in this breach? How did it happen? Well, uh, just like in the target breach, there was a third party that was at the heart of it. Um, JP Morgan Chase uh, had a whole bunch of countermeasures with the 250 million that they were investing. They had uh, two-factor authentication deployed almost everywhere. And what happened is they had a third party by the name of Simco Data Systems. Simco Data Systems ran one of the websites that was responsible for handling JP Morgan Chase's annual charitable uh, marathons. And employees were logging into that third party charitable marathon race website very often using the same credentials that they were using for their corporate banking logging in. And the, 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 the issue with that is that, of course, if you have shared passwords uh, and, and no two-factor authentication, then attackers could, say, break into the charitable marathon race website and then be able to break into, uh, you know, corp. Now, of course, JP Morgan Chase, being a, being a bank, uh, employed two-factor authentication uh, so that if just passwords are getting reused or passwords getting stolen, that in and of itself should not have resulted in a breach. Unfortunately, there were there was one server or a few servers at JP Morgan Chase 
that did not have the two-factor authentication enabled. And so attackers were able to compromise a website's or ticket and zip code data systems, uh, get some of the passwords that people were using for the Channel of the Marathon race website, and use that to log in. Uh, the attackers were able to use those passwords to log in to a uh, server that did not have the two-factor authentication enabled. And that is how the JP Morgan Chase breach occurred. Uh, it could have been prevented using a whole bunch of different technologies, making sure, for instance, that multi-factor authentication was indeed on everywhere, right? As defenders, we have to get things right everywhere. Attackers often to get their initial footprint have to just compromise one, one place um, and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, not reusing passwords, having antiphon training, all those things could have could have helped. But that's pretty much how the this breach occurred. After this breach occurred, JP Morgan Chase doubled their security budget to over 500 million annually. Um, and, and I was glad to see that as a, as a reaction. So that was at uh, 2014. In 2015, one of the most significant breaches was at the Office of Personnel Management. The Office of Personnel Management is to an extent like the HR, Human Resources Agency, for uh, hundreds of government agencies. And what the attackers did is they broke into OPM and were able to steal over 20 million of the background check records. So when you want to become a government employee for a whole bunch of uh, agencies, uh, you have to go through a pretty detailed background check where not only are, are you interviewed and not only is your sensitive social security number and whatnot present, but they get that kind of data for all your family members, for your neighbors, friends. And um, unfortunately, uh, the Office of Personnel Management was only investing $7 million a year annually on their security. Um, by comparison, the Department of Agriculture was investing over 70 million in their security. And so there were a bunch of basic defenses that were not present at the Office of Personnel Management. They did not have two-factor authentication deployed. Uh, and basically the attackers used uh, malware as, as in addition to a bunch of other tools to compromise OPM. Uh, one out of every five machines at OPM was infected with malware um, at the time that they uh, brought in Silence to help them uh, try to get a handle on the problem. Of course, it was way too late. There were two particular attacker groups, suspected Chinese attacker groups um, that, had, that had broken into OPM following notifications that they got from, from US CERT, the US Computer Emergency Response Team. They uh, pretty much uh, identified one set of attackers and thought that one set of attackers was the only set of attackers. They went about um, executing a, a big bang to try to get them out. So, you, you know, for those of you that have dealt with significant incidents, you know that once you identify that the attackers are in, um, you need to kick them all out in one shot because if you if you kick them out only on some of your systems but not others, and they get the feedback that you're onto them, they will then you know, start their mass exfiltration and take out as much as they can before you completely kick them out. So, so OPM had went about trying to kick out this attacker group, uh, uh, which they termed X1. Uh, unbeknownst to them, there was another attacker group, X2, also Chinese. There was, um, uh, it, it's expected that um, there, was, there was some coordination between the two attacker groups and uh, they, they just weren't able to get all the attackers uh, out in time. And so in, in, in a period of about uh, a year and a half to two years, uh, over, over 20 million background check records were stolen and uh, 5.6 uh, fingerprint records were stolen. Um, and, and this is bad uh, because the counterintelligence impact of this uh, will, will probably impact intelligence agencies at least for another generation, if not, if not more. Um, so, so in any case, I will, I will, uh, that, that's all I'll say about o OPM. Uh, in the aftermath of this breach, uh, you know, the government gave, I gave uh, credit monitoring protection out to those folks that were impacted. Unfortunately, your credit is only a very small sliver of your online, of your online presence. And uh, th there wasn't protection for your assets or other aspects of, of your online identity. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, OPM, pretty much most government agencies except the CIA were using 
um, the o OPM for their personnel records. Uh, the CIA happened to be using their happened to be using their own database. But you know, if you're say a foreign nation state adversary and you want to understand, say for instance, who are the spies in your country, who are the CIA agents, you can look at you know the data set of everybody that was breached. You can look at the set of aliases that are on file with your State Department, and basically anybody that's not listed in the OPM records, maybe your list of CIA agents. So, so this was a, a very significant breach with regards to counterintelligence impact. Um, and it occurred mostly due to underinvestment in uh, cybersecurity, uh, insufficient anti-malware defenses, um, and, and lack of two-factor authentication. The very next year, uh, Yahoo had announced uh, two breaches. Uh, the announcements were made in 2016, but the breaches had occurred in 2013 and 2014. And through the breaches at Yahoo, attackers were able to uh, get access to any of the 3 billion Yahoo accounts um, that were used for email or other, or other purposes. This is probably the largest breach in the history of the internet with regards to the number of records that were exposed or accounts that were exposed and accessible. Uh, how did how did how did this breach occur? Um, it started off with spear phishing of some employees at Yahoo. The attackers also injected malware onto a number of systems at Yahoo. But what made this breach super interesting for me is that not only did they use spear phishing malware to get in and steal a database of 500 million users and then a billion users, but what the attackers did is they reverse engineered Yahoo's cookie generation algorithm. So for all of us who know how websites work, right, you log in with the username and password, but once your credentials are checked, you're then given a cookie. You're given an authentication cookie, and then it's really that authentication cookie that goes back and forth between your browser and the server uh, that authenticates you so that you don't have to log into every every single page, given that HTTP is a, is a stateless protocol. Um, in any case, what the attackers did is they stole the source code that was used to generate cookies on Yahoo's website. And once they had done that, um, they could use, use that source code and or use access to a system, Yahoo's account management tool, to generate cookies for any user that they chose. So given only someone's Yahoo email address, they were able to log in at will to any Yahoo account. And so this particular attack, by the way, was conducted by four uh, Russians, two ex-FSB agents. And once they had that capability, they basically started logging in at will to thousands of Yahoo accounts uh, to target Russian journalists, to target diplomats, to target all kinds of people of importance and leverage data in their Yahoo email account. By the way, once your Yahoo email account is compromised, they were then able to start breaking into email accounts at other places uh, like Google and Hotmail, because when a lot of people set up their say Google or Hotmail accounts, they use their Yahoo email address as their recovery email address. So once you, you're able to get control over a person's Yahoo email address, you can then issue password resets, basically ask uh, Google Gmail or Hotmail or any other email service provider to, to reset your password. And an email comes to the, to the compromised Yahoo email account, uh, you know, inviting you to reset your password. So the attackers can then reset it to whatever they wanted it to be. So in any case, this was probably one of the largest uh, breaches in the history of the internet with regards to number of records. The breaches got disclosed in 2016 when Yahoo was in the process of getting acquired by Verizon. Verizon had initially agreed to pay about $4.8 million for the company, and they dropped that price by $350 million when news of, of these breaches uh, occurred. So that in itself is significant, let alone regulatory fines and costs to uh, do incident response and forensics and legal and whatnot. So very, very significant breach. The very next year, um, as if it wasn't uh, bad enough that, uh, you know, most government employees had their records stolen and, uh, you know, attackers had access to everyone's Yahoo email addresses. Um, 
there was uh, a breach at Equifax in which approximately half of the country's um, uh, metadata around their credit records was stolen. So the way that this breach occurred was there was a unpatched Apache Strut server um, that um, Equifax was not able to patch in time. In March 2017, Apache had made available uh, the patch. Um, Equifax's security team uh, did go ahead and scan for this vulnerability and sent out about 400 emails to people saying, okay, you got to patch your Apache Strut servers. Um, they, the, the, the team at Equifax had also uh, done a bunch of scans to see whether or not they were vulnerable, but there were a whole bunch of things that went wrong. So first of all, if you're relying on humans to make patches just when you send out emails and you don't have tickets to track the open vulnerabilities and you don't have technical verification as a follow-up to the scans to see whether or not the patches were actually successful, you're in a bad place. Um, unfortunately, uh, what happened was, was, was worse than that because of the fact that um, there were not only, it was, things were even worse because they were using a end of life McAfee vulnerability scanner um, to scan for the Apache Struts vulnerabilities. And that vulnerability scanner had a whole, whole bunch of false negatives. It was not detecting the live vulnerabilities. So pretty much they were blind to whether or not the vulnerabilities were still there and they were, you know, the security team might have thought they were actually patched because the vulnerability scanner wasn't reporting it anymore. Um, so in any case, in the media, in the media, um, the, the Apache Sweats vulnerability seems to uh, take the cake with regards to why this breach occurred. But I'd say that what really happened was uh, a lot deeper than that. There were false negatives at the scanners. They did not have a closed loop uh, vulnerability management system in place. Uh, that relied on ticketing. The attackers used that Apache Struts vulnerability to initially get in. And from there, they planted about 30 web shells within Equifax. Um, the, the network was pretty flat. They were able to get access to about 60 different databases. Um, some of the databases and web applications had web vulnerabilities. And so the attackers injected a JSP page into one of the systems that allowed them to steal data in that database and how they got data out of each and every database was a little bit different. There were unencrypted credentials for some of the databases sitting in configuration files inside the environment. So in any case, the reason that this breach occurred was a lot, a lot more in, in, in deeper than just, okay, there was an Apache Struts vulnerability. Um, in any case, I could, I could go on and talk about more. There's a lot more details in, in the corresponding chapter of my book, but this could have been prevented by timely patching, network segmentation, encrypting those credentials, et cetera. Um, the next breach that I'm going to talk about is a breach that occurred at Facebook in 2018 due to a issue in their view as feature. Uh, but let me mention that Facebook has had a number of different hacks and breaches over time. In, in most of the chapters of my book, I talk about one organization and one breach that occurred. Uh, in the Facebook chapter, um, uh, Basically, there's 10 different security incidents that I catalog, some which were hacked, some which were breaches. The, the distinction, of course, being to, to legally have something be a breach in the United States, uh, uh, you've got to have people's names plus some sensitive data about themselves stolen. Uh, there's a bunch of compromises that occur that um, in which other information is stolen, uh, but but that doesn't constitute a legal breach. It's, 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 a, it's a hack. So in any case, and we, we've all heard of the issues that Facebook had with Cambridge Analytica, a third party developer that had abused some of Facebook's APIs and stolen profile information from you know, 80 or so million uh, accounts. And then that data got used to target voters in swing states. But the breach that I'm gonna talk about is even after Facebook locked down their APIs such that third party developers could not steal as much information, you got to ask the question, if you're a nation state attacker, and then you still want access to that user profile data um, to uh, target voters as, as occurred with the Russian information and disinformation attacks as for the Mueller report or otherwise, the question is how do you do it once they've locked down the APIs? And so the attackers used a set of three vulnerabilities 
in a breach in which they took advantage of the Facebook view as functionality. So if I look at my author page on Facebook, um, when I log in, I, it shows me ability to uh, edit. It shows me a whole bunch of different tabs. It does allow me to click this button saying view as visitor so that I could see what my author page on Facebook looks like when I'm, when I'm looking at it as a visitor, just a member of the general public um, who doesn't have you know, deep read, write access to my accounts. And you know, you see the page looks a lot cleaner. Now, unfortunately, there were three vulnerabilities that came together, which allowed attackers to scrape data from over 50 million Facebook profiles. And there was a nice blog post that Facebook put out as to how this particular breach occurred. And so let me briefly describe the three vulnerabilities that came together. The first one was that uh, there was a, a feature which allowed people who are viewing their profile to wish um, you know, their, their friends a happy birthday. And that box um, incorrectly allowed people to post a video so that they couldn't just you know, write happy birthday, but they could post, a, a, say, a video birthday message. That was the first thing that went wrong. Second thing that went wrong is that there was a new version of the video uploader that Facebook had rolled out, which generated uh, access tokens that um, didn't just let people have the basic permission to view a profile, but had the permissions of the Facebook mobile app, the full permissions of the Facebook mobile app. And then the third thing that went wrong is that um, when the Facebook application generated an access token for people that were viewing the profile, it generated an access token not for the person in a read-only mode as a viewer, but generated a read-write access token for the user that was actually being looked up. So basically, just by viewing your profile, it was as if the attacker could log into your account and have full read-write access. These three vulnerabilities came together uh, in uh, 2018, and the attackers uh, were able to scrape a whole bunch of profiles, tens of millions of profiles, when, when, when Facebook saw that there was anomalous activity happening around the view as feature. And they started looking into it. They initially just immediately reset 90 million access tokens, uh, 90 million profiles. And then upon detailed investigation, they found out that it was only uh, 30 or 50 million uh, profiles that were actually affected. But you could imagine that this is, this is you know, pretty, pretty significant. So this breach occurred due to software vulnerabilities as the, as the root cause and was pretty sophisticated. Um, also in 2018, I thought it would be worthwhile, and I don't have time to go through all the breaches in, in, in as much detail as I would like, but in 2018, uh, Marriott had a breach in which they, um, they had acquired Starwood, which was probably the next largest hotel management company, and the combination of the two made them the largest hotel company in the, in the world. Um, they had acquired Starwood. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to them, Starwood was breached with malware three years prior to the acquisition, three or more years prior to the acquisition. And upon acquiring, you know, if you're a company and you acquired a breach company, well, you're breached too. In this particular case, there was suspected Chinese attackers behind this where, you know, if you're interested not only in say, all the identities of the government agents, but then you're also interested in, well, where the heck have they been staying over, over, over the years? Then, you know, the next likely target that you breach is Marriott. So, um, so in any case, I, 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 I don't have time to talk about all the fun details in, in this particular breach, but um, it, it, it could have been prevented by, uh, not all, by doing more vetting of, uh, you know, when Marriott was acquiring Starwood and having stronger anti-malware uh, defenses, more details in the book. Um, I'm going to talk about just two more breaches given, given the time. I'm going to talk about the Capital One breach from 2019, which is probably um, the largest cloud security breach uh, to date. Uh, a single loan attacker, not an organized cyber criminal, not a nation state group of attackers, um, an ex-Amazon employee was able to, um, using no insider knowledge about Capital One, identify that Capital One had two issues, a misconfiguration in their, in their firewall and a server-side request forgery vulnerability, uh, and was able to steal 100 million 
social security numbers and other information that were in a set of credit applications that were stored in Amazon's simple storage service in uh, Capital One's cloud on Amazon. Uh, the attacker uh, was was um, found pretty pretty quickly, was assessed a 250K fine, was given five years in jail. But for Capital One, the breach costs were estimated in excess of 100 million. And I think they got one regulatory fine, just uh, 80 million in and of itself. Let me talk a little bit about how, how this breach occurred. And uh, I know that I might have folks in the audience that have different levels of technical uh, background and sophistication. So I'll try to go over this uh, at, a, at a high level about how this particular attack occurred. On the left, we see the attacker's machine. On the right-hand side, we have Capital One's uh, virtual machines that were running in, in Amazon in what are called EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud instances. And um, when you run virtual machines on the cloud, given that the virtual machines may pop up in different data centers on different days, at different times, whatever, virtual machines need to know some basic information about themselves, like what is their IP address? And so um, the, the virtual machines are able to ask a metadata service running within Amazon um, locally uh, and ask questions like, well, what are my IP address? And um, that's what you see to the right. In the middle, uh, bottom, you see Capital One's S3 or simple storage service buckets. Think of these as just like you have folders on your hard disk, which you store data, there's folders in the cloud and they're just called these S3 buckets. <clears throat> and, and, and those buckets are the ones that had the credit card applications. So what did the attacker do? Well, the attacker um, noticed that application software on the Capital One virtual machines had a vulnerability. They had a vulnerability where um, one was able to ask questions like, what are your IP address uh, and or what security credentials do you have? And because of the fact that this application software on the virtual machine had what's called a server-side request forgery vulnerability, the attacker was able to, to use that vulnerability to forge requests to Amazon's metadata service as if uh, you know, the, the attacker owned the virtual machine. Um, and so what was interesting about this is that the attacker was not able to pose queries asking, hey, what are my security credentials, which, you know, virtual machines running in Amazon are, are allowed to do. Um, the attacker was able to ask the virtual machine, hey, what security credentials do you have? Because of the server-side request forgery vulnerability, that query would get passed off to the metadata service. And the response would not only be sent to the virtual machine, but that response of what security credentials do I have got relayed back to the attacker. So the attacker gets to find out, oh, this particular virtual machine has uh, credentials which allow it to pose as the web application firewall. And so the attacker says, great, you have web application firewall credentials, um, can you not just, uh, can you also tell me what the credentials are? And so the attacker poses a query, uh, which says, uh, give me the actual credentials. Um, because the fact that Amazon's metadata service is, w w becomes what's called a confused deputy in computer science parlance, uh, the metadata service doesn't know if it's, you know, Capital One's virtual machine or the attacker that's asking for the credentials. In this particular case, it's the attacker and the, the vulnerable virtual machine is simply relaying the data back and forth. So the actual credentials themselves get relayed off to the attacker. The attacker can then go to the, um, you know, can take those credentials, locally cache them in their command line and ask Capital One simple storage buckets, hey, what folders can I access with these credentials? Um, at this point, the Capital One S3 buckets have no way to distinguish the attacker from a legitimate accessor because the attacker has the legitimate credentials. And so when the attacker then asks, oh, okay, thanks for telling me about all these different folders that are accessible. Can you please give me the data in the folders? The Capital One S3 buckets happily respond with the data in the 700 buckets that have 100 million credit card applications. This is when the breach occurred. The attacker then took this data, uploaded it into a GitHub or a GitLab repository, uh, also happened to upload her resume into the, into the same repository, 
and uh, you know it's kind of game over for Capital One. It's game over for the attacker. Um, that's how the Capital One breach occurred. The very last breach that I'll briefly talk about is the Solar Winds. Uh, actually, the the last hack that I'm going to talk about is the Solar Winds hack from mid December 2020, in which Solar Winds, a IT provider that sold IT monitoring and other software to over 300,000 organizations uh, was, was, was hacked. Um, the attackers uh, broke in using a set of typical uh, you know, account credential, or uh, they may have a, had a third party themselves. Uh, the SolarWinds CEO, the new CEO there, he's got it down to these three hypotheses about how the attackers got in. But once they were able to get in, what the attackers did is they infiltrated the build process that was used to compile their Orion product. And the attackers injected just one piece of, uh, one file, one piece of malicious code, which allowed them to send malicious code updates to customers of the SolarWinds Orion platform. And so the attackers were able to get those malicious code updates out to about 16 plus thousand of SolarWinds customers. Uh, a number of their customers were government agencies, uh, nine important government agencies, in fact, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Commerce, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, uh, as well as about 100 private sector clients. And the attackers were able to see everything from Department of Justice emails from about 3,000 accounts at the Department of Justice to steal attack tools from FireEye to view Microsoft's uh, source code. So basically, SolarWinds was a third-party compromise in which SolarWinds was a third party that was used to basically break into a whole bunch of other systems. Uh, you know, the initial break in, it's unclear how sophisticated that was, but the instrumentation of the build pipeline for the SolarWinds Orion product was, was done in a very pre pretty sophisticated way. CrowdStruck has a nice write up about how that occurred, but uh, just another example in which a third party compromise was used. This is probably the largest espionage attack of all time. Um, there, there were a lot of statements that were made about how this was a digital Pearl Harbor uh, at the outset, but you know the attacker's goal was not war, the attacker's goal was espionage. Um, and, and hence the you know, actual targets that they went over, went after using SolarWinds as a, as a, um, as a uh, third party. So in any case, that, that, that's a whole bunch of the different breaches. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, okay, what do we need to do to, 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 to get better in the field? So let me chat a little bit about some technology defenses that we can employ and what we can do uh, with regards to future investment in cybersecurity make things hopefully a little bit better, if not a lot better. So um, I'm, I'm bringing up uh, you know, this slide where on the left-hand side, we have all the root causes of breach, um, except in just talking, instead of just talking about who got hacked on the right side, what I talk about here and what I list, and this is a good cheat sheet, are what are the example countermeasures that you should deploy to make sure that you're not susceptible to these root causes of breach. So for things like unencrypted data, well, enable storage encryption where you've got, uh, make sure that data is not only encrypted at rest, but it's encrypted in transit, and it's also encrypted when in use. So, so use, obviously, SSL and TLS to protect data in transit. Um, but uh, when data is in use, you know, you don't, ju just because somebody gets a root account you don't want that to result in a breach. That's typically what's occurred, but you can leverage secure enclaves such that a distinct processor and a distinct set of memory is used for unencrypted data. So that even if an attacker gets root on your main processor, that does not mean that they can get access to unencrypted data. Um, and by the way, for each of these countermeasures, for each of these root causes, so for instance, for phishing uh, an account takeover, if you don't just rely on you know, two-factor authentication using a mobile app, but uh, you use two-factor authentication using a hardware security key, either that's built into people's mobile phones or that are uh, built into these hardware security keys via, say, a YubiKey or some other provider, then, you know, if you deploy that level of defense, you can just eliminate phishing attacks altogether in the same way that Google and Salesforce have done back in 2017. Um, even though they're regularly targeted by nation states, uh, it's it's very 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 difficult to uh, to to take over an account. 
Um, in any case, there's a lot of technologies that I employ here for all the root causes of breach. I don't have the time to go through all of them. Please feel free to uh, check out the book. Um, but uh, we need to deploy the countermeasures, scientifically effective countermeasures, um, you know, for these root causes of breach, uh, as opposed to just checking the box. For many other things in compliance, you can just go ahead and check the box. But for these root causes of breach, deploy scientifically effective countermeasures. Um, finally, what I'll do is I'll go through, so one of the things that I did is I was interested in, um, I, I studied a little bit about the $45 billion that's been invested in cybersecurity startups uh, over the past 15 years. And I looked at the 4,000 cybersecurity companies that have been invested in, and you know, clearly uh, something's going wrong here because the breaches have just been continuing. So what do we have to do in order to invest in the right areas to help. Now, one of the things that I found when you know using sources like Crunchbase and PitchBook compiled all the data on all the companies that have been invested in and what do they do, it was interesting to see that of the 4,000 companies, very few of them described themselves in ways that focused on these root clauses of breach. Rather, most Cybersecurity startups identify themselves as, you know, platforms or solutions or whatever, right? Um, and, and by the way, I looked up, I looked up a whole bunch of ones that did focus on these root clauses, um, and, and, and just in their descriptions, it, it didn't seem to call out. Okay, um, we focus on uh, preventing account takeover or whatnot. Oh, I, I just heard a buzz, uh, Kim. I don't know uh, what that means. Does that mean that we should transition into questions soon, or? Uh, no, no, I, I think we still have, uh, we've got about two minutes and then we should transition to questions. Sounds great. Good. I'll, okay. I'll wrap up in, in two minutes. So in any case, you know, I did this analysis of wh where are all the investments going? And, and uh, I think we basically need more companies that focus on the root causes of breach and or making the countermeasures for the root cause of a breach more easily deployable. Um, that said, that said, from the 45 billion that's gone in, um, just a few stats in, this, in these two minutes, about 11 billion has gone into network security, which is a necessary, uh, you know, necessary but not sufficient defense. Uh, 11 billion gone into network security. We can then use that as a baseline to look at a whole bunch of other areas to understand are we over investing, under investing, or sufficiently investing in a bunch of other areas. So there's been about 10 billion that's gone into blockchain, which, you know, to an extent, the advent of Bitcoin and whatnot has been has been great. But I would put forth that there that this is an area that's over invested. Um, there's been no one killer app beyond the, the, the Bitcoin currency. Um, and it's been, you know, more than 10 years since the birth of, of, of Bitcoin, probably 12, 13 years. And so uh, I think that we should probably, re by the way, I'm not saying don't invest in a blockchain or cryptocurrency company. I think just the bar should be very high. They've got to be completely awesome and game changing if you're going to do that. But I do think that there's area, there, there's dollars that should go into other areas. So uh, areas like, like cloud security and mobile security seem to have the, about the right level of investment. There's about 10 billion that's gone into cloud security, uh, private equity and public IPO investment. Not counting, not counting the amount that's gone uh, into these areas by the major cloud providers themselves. Um, mobile security, there's been about 6.6 .6 billion that's gone in. Um, however, mobile security and mobile devices have not been emerging as uh, like a major root cause of, of breaches, right? If we look at the, the, the major five or six root causes, just a vulnerability on a mobile phone is not showing up. Maybe unencrypted data on a mobile phone, sure, but but otherwise, um, my guess is that the level of investment is, is probably sufficient. Now, mobile devices will are becoming our first screens as opposed to our second or third screens. So I imagine more investment will be necessary, but it's not the area where we're having pain. I do think areas that we're having major pain and that, that need a lot more investment uh, to ensure a good future for cybersecurity are listed on this slide and the next. We have 
hundreds of thousands of open jobs in cybersecurity just in the US alone. There are millions of jobs available worldwide. There's going to be no way that we're going to be able to hire or train enough people fast enough. So what we've got to do is we've got to use artificial intelligence as a tool to automate away the most basic tasks. And this is not about taking jobs away from people. This is about just getting to a point where we can not have a big, big breach every every month or so. Uh, there's about $8 billion that's gone into AI-based automation. I suspect we can benefit from a lot more. Um, another area that I think is interesting is analytics. There's been $4 billion that's gone into security analytics. Um, however, you know, if there's $45 billion that's gone in total and there's only $4 billion helping us figure out where we should direct the rest of the investment, chances are we could benefit from more analytics. Most CEOs have a business analytics or a business intelligence team that helps them make decisions about where to put money next to grow the business. Uh, CISOs don't really have as much automated intelligence that comes in to help them direct their investments. Uh, privacy is another area that needs more investment. In 2019, Facebook was fined $5 billion uh, for privacy issues. Um, that's three times more the amount that's been invested in privacy-related cybersecurity startups uh, with, with only $1.5 billion going in. Um, fraud detection, there, 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 there's more fraud that happens every year than that than has been invested in that area in the past 15 years. So anyway, in any case, that you know, that, that I talked about a few areas that are uh, require more investment. There's more listed on this slide. Um, we've got we've got a lot more to do. We've got a lot more work in our field to address the root causes of breach. I would encourage both CISOs as well as uh, venture capitalists to um, focus on root causes. Don't get distracted by the latest new cool security vendor. Uh, don't focus on just achieving the minimum bar. Uh, compliance should be achieved as a side effect. And if we focus on root causes and invest both in our security programs and more generally into what we need to do to protect against the root causes of attack, I think we could be doing a lot, doing a lot better as a field. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, Dr. Neal. I always know when we have an awesome speaker, when we have more questions than we're probably going to have time for. So um, one question, the reason you're hearing that noise, that's people um, already going to your profile and, and trying to private message you, but oh, you can't private message them because you're in the middle of a presentation. So oh, yeah. that's what that noise is. But um, before I get to some of the meat of these questions, I've had a ton of people ask, um, are your slides available? Um, many people would like to know if your slides are available. If they are, we can post them and we can have people download them. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. I think I provided a PDF of the slides okay. to Caitlin already. You're more than welcome to post those and share. Okay. So that's probably what people are pinging you about right now. The okay. second thing people want to know, and we will email this to everyone, is what is the name of your book and where can they oh. find it? Great. Yeah. So the name of the book, uh, you'll see here, it's on the, the right-hand part of the slide. It's called Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone. So that'll be great for everyone. When we um, put the slides out there, you guys will have access to that. I have um, Adolf, who I know is a CISO. He had an early on question and he said, to what extent has the speaker been able to correlate credentials stuffing attacks to actual breaches? So credential stuffing attacks are an important uh, type of attack that has resulted in a, in a whole bunch of breaches. So um, I, I do cover credential stuffing uh, in the appropriate countermeasures chapter in the book. Um, I, I have not uh, correlated credential stuffing specifically to uh, breaches, except to identify that account takeover is a major root cause of breach. So when credential stuffing takes place, the attacker's goal is to take over existing accounts. And so, for example, in the JP Morgan Chase case that I talked about, the attacker's goal was to take over existing accounts. They did so in that case, not using credential stuffing, but by compromising an existing website. Uh, but um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if credential stuffing was used as a very significant mechanism to take over accounts that then resulted in breaches. I have Brian, he said, 
Um, doesn't the government standards go across departments? That must have been something you were talking about early on. Sure. So uh, government standards do go across a whole bunch of departments. In fact, when I talked about the OPM attack, OPM had received multiple failed security audits uh, that were done based on government standards. They had lost the permission to operate, the authority to operate the ATOs for like nine of their critical systems. They kept operating anyway. And so, so we can see that, um, you know, just having the standards is not enough. Just auditing to the standards is not enough. There's got to be stronger enforcement. And if there's systems that have lost its authority to operate, those systems should be shut down because what we can see will ha can happen will, will be much worse than the unavailability. And then we had Norman Storman, who's another CISO that you'll meet later today. He, right. he just shouted out asking if you were going to cover solar winds, which you did. And then I just wanted to throw, wanted to make sure he knew I saw that question. Charles D., um, and you may have commented on this because I did walk away for a minute. Um, did you, were you going to provide any information on the 2017 net, uh, not Petya attacks? So, so in 2017, uh, there was a whole bunch of ransomware attacks, not Petya, WannaCry, um, affected over 200,000 organizations. Um, you know, I, 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 I provide some brief coverage in the book, but I don't go, uh, in, into it, uh, into that particular attack in, in tons of depth. Uh, there's a lot of interesting um, characteristics there in terms of like what vulnerabilities were used to author the malware, where the information about that vulnerability came from. Uh, but but uh, unfortunately, just just didn't have time to to cover it. I think that making sure that you have a strong anti malware defense uh, to to protect yourself against ransomware and also having strong backups is really important. I will mention that since those attacks, the WannaCry and not uh, uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, ransomware has gotten more sophisticated. They used to just um, encrypt data and ask for ransom. Now, ransomware is also exfiltrating the data. So previously, you could just pay the ransom and not even have to notify the state attorney general about a breach. But the second that you have ransomware that, um, that exfiltrates data, well, then it is a reportable breach. And ransomware has also started more, much more heavily targeting backups as well. So your backups have got to be, um, you know, ideally write once, read many, uh, but but immutable uh, if you want those backups to stand up against ransomware. Uh, this shell just said really good explanation on the COF breach. Um, more people asking about the slides. Mohammed asked, um, attackers are getting very sophisticated. How secure are the financial information of our deposits with banks and financial institutions? That's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think I think what we've seen is that tax against banks are possible. Um, we have not seen large breaches publicly get announced where attackers have been able to transfer massive amounts of, of money, um, but there have been attacks where, where money has been stolen. Um, and I think that, I, I mean, beyond that, I, I, you know, I haven't done an audit of every single major bank. I, I, I probably couldn't comment on exactly how secure are all, uh, are all banks. Um, you know, I'll tell you that, um, you know, it's, um, but I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I still keep all my paper statements for all my banks. Um, and uh, I think it's important to have uh, good records. Um, I, I do think that if there's a major compromise of a bank where significant amounts of money are, are, are stolen or transferred, um, it would be, it would be you know, kind of like a, a, a national security type of issue. That is such a good point about keeping your paper records because many people don't. We don't want paper around and we may need them soon. There's so many other questions and I, I, I'm pretty, I'm going to ask my tech team, are we at time? I know they're back there. They're not talking to me. Oh, we do? Okay, good. Because we still have plenty of questions. Um, it, it sounds like we have 10 more minutes. 
Um, if data in transit and at rest is encrypted, why is it so important that they encrypt data in use, if that made sense? I'm reading it as he uh, stated it. So the reason to encrypt data in use is because even if you've protected your data at rest, and even if you protect it in transit, the problem is that the second that an attacker gets access to a root account or an administrative account, an admin account, then pretty much they, they, can, they can tell the system to decrypt the data at rest and the system will happily do it because the attacker then has a legitimate root or admin credential. Um, same thing applies in transit. Um, however, if you use a secure enclave to protect data as it's in use, then unencrypted data is only accessed by a separate processor uh, and separate memory. So not your general purpose CPU, not your general purpose memory. And the attacker uh, has to go through uh, significantly more effort than just stealing an admin or a root account in order to um, get access to the sensitive data. Okay, we had man wire, if I'm saying that right. Is there a global DB access to find ourselves in cred farming DBs? Uh, I, I wanna thank the, the, the person asking for that question. I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I understand the question. Yeah, and I'm reading it as it is, um, as th they can try to rephrase it if they want. Um, thanks for the great presentation, Professor. Great presentation, great presentation. Very um, insightful. Uh, let me just make sure I'm not missing. Um, did I, what, Marianne asks, what percentage is invested in technology and what percentage is invested in people? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I probably couldn't take a stab at how, how, much, um, how much in terms of countermeasures is invested in, say, technology versus people. I, I, will, I, will, I will say this. I think that a lot of times when CISOs look at defenses, uh, people think about it in terms of people, process, and technology. I will say that um, you know, I think I think investing people is all is always a good thing. Whenever you can train people, it's a, it's a good thing. But if we want to have a systematically scalable defense, and you look at how often humans have made the wrong decisions and they've run into security issues as a result, um, you know, it's probably all too often. So I think we need to have defenses that, uh, and we we need to get around to thinking about cybersecurity in the same way that. Um, consumer device companies think TVs, think cars, think about safety. They, they, you know, even in computer science, we have this concept called uh, idiot proofing, and that doesn't mean we think all of our all use, our users are idiots. But uh, when you think about it, um, like what can you do with a TV remote control that's going to result in electrocuting yourself? Very little. I think we need to adopt that kind of mindset. So I, I think that. Uh, what I'd suggest, and I, I, I'm a technologist by background, um, I would love to see a day where our technologies are, are good enough, where we have digital seatbelts, which are good enough to protect us without humans always having to do the right things. I think, for instance, when the Equifax CEO tried to blame a particular administrator for not issuing a patch, uh, I think that is the wrong direction. I think the right direction is to invest in scalable systems that can patch tens of tens or hundreds of thousands of servers um, automatically, and perhaps only alert humans uh, when they've tried to do the patch the umpteenth time uh, and still hasn't been able to be successful. And then you really need a human to do something about it. I think we need to move in a direction where we, we rely on a lot less uh, uh, rely a lot less on people to always be doing the right things. Uh, technology we should automate, automate, automate like crazy. With regards to process, I do think, you know, good processes are important um, and we should invest in good processes. Uh, but I think we also need technical checks and balances to make sure that the processes are always functioning right, because the chance of them functioning right 100 percent of the time is next to nil. Um, so I, I, I do think, um, you know, I don't I don't have 
the actual percentage of investment that's gone into each of these three areas. I think if you look at different organizations, they invest differently. But I think the more that we can re rely on automation, the more that we can rely on scalable technologies to do the right things on behalf of humans uh, and check our processes and have more automated processes, I think that'll put our, our field in a better place. Well, um, before I comment on this, Next comment, I can understand where this person's coming because I do host a radio show and security for all. And I have a lot of um, a lot of really intelligent people that come on that show. And we talk about the human element of cybersecurity all the time. And this and I, I feel the frustration of the CISOs and the security teams. And he said, as a former CISO, we used to try to make our um, we used to try to make our security idiot proof, but they keep making better idiots, <laughs> which, you know, I understand, you know, people are still clicking on things that they shouldn't be clicking on. And it's like, here we are today. Why is this happening still? So um, that was just a comment you don't have to address. And then and the last question um I, the person rephrased her question or his question. And he said, I meant to ask, is there a way to find ourselves after a credential farming attack, like a government website that displays all compromised accounts? And we have three minutes left. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so by the way, I, I, I will address that, that, that point about, uh, you know, better idiots and whatnot. You know, I, I think this, this, this business of, um, you know, uh, trying to protect against people clicking on the wrong things. I think the approach we need to take is to get our technologies, our browsers and whatnot to a point that regardless of whatever you click on, it's not going to result in a drive-by attack. Or even if you click on a phishing website and it takes you to an imposter website, if you're using hardware security keys, then even if the person gives up the password, um, the attacker is not going to be able to, to log in uh, because you need a, a hardware security key. <laughs> Right. So I think there is a way we can we can defend even against the most uh, idiotic of idiots, right? If you want to talk about it that way. Um, so I did want to comment on that. My apologies. I, I I didn't I didn't understand that that last question. And the platform is going to cut us off in about two minutes. So you can try to answer that in the last the remaining time we have. Uh, got got it. I may I may have to kindly ask you to repeat the question. Um, is there a way to find ourselves after credential farming attacks like government websites that display all compromised accounts? Okay. So after there's been a credential farming attack, I would recommend resetting all the credentials. I would also recommend in a, in a credential farming attack or a credential stuffing attack, the goal is to go after the passwords. We cannot have only passwords, a single factor, be sufficient uh, to protect us. We need to have two factor and we need to leverage hardware security keys. So I hope that that provides some of an answer. And I know that I haven't been able to answer everybody's questions, but if you're interested in learning more, please uh, drop by computersecurity.stanford.edu. We have a whole bunch of courses ranging from uh, the simple and straightforward foundations of information security, all the way to emerging threats and defenses, cybersecurity and executive strategy. Uh, we have a bunch of advanced topics. And so, uh, you know, you can you can see myself chatting with Vince Cerf, who co-invented the internet, about some of the basics, as well as more advanced stuff. So I, I thank everybody for their questions. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, their time. I sure did enjoy talking to all of you. Uh, please, uh, please uh, check out the book, check out our courses, and we look forward to working together to continue to collaborate to make our country and the world uh, a more uh, safe and cyber secure place. Dr. Neil DeSalwani, Director of Stanford University Advanced Security. Thank you so much for being on our show. We look forward to having you back again because we could spend all afternoon with you. So thank you so much. And everyone, we're going to take a short break and we will be back with Excelion, their short presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim.